All right, so um, this is Jason Turner. Um, he and I lived four or five doors down about 10 years ago before I left the comfortable neighborhood of Warren. And uh, one thing I've always admired about Jason is his ability to um, stay on top of the current technologies. Something I do is I only use enough to do my, my job at the level that I'm doing. And Jason has always seemed to be at the very forefront of what's going on. He's also very innovative. He does many different creative things. And uh, how he juggles it all has always been fairly impressive to me. And then he has enough time to spend plenty of time with his family. So um, he's respected in his profession. I have two or three friends that actually deal with him on a professional level. They all like working with him and speak very highly of him. So, as far as ground rules, uh, I'm going to be in the back, and I am here to learn as much as you guys are. Um, when he's talking about things, I'm going to be jotting down notes, is the way you guys probably should if you want to learn from this opportunity. Um, and as I jot down notes, certain things will pop up on the quiz and then the uh, final exam from what he's teaching. So, uh, please know, you know, if he invites you to talk, you know, give him good feedback, talk with him. Uh, but try to stay off your computers other than what he asks you to do, off your phones other than what he asks you to do, and let's just have uh, a very good time, and I'm going to give him the rest of it. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, and then after that, I would love interaction. I don't, I don't, I think this was called a guest lecture, and I don't want to be a guest lecturer. I, I want to learn from you guys as much as I'm learn, you're learning from me. Um, but to go back a slide, let's see if this is going to work. This is kind of what I wanted to talk about. If, if there's two things that, I, that you should take away from my presentation, it would be hopefully that you come to identify who you are and why you are sitting right here or why you are planning to do what you're planning to do. Um, that's kind of where I was deciding to go with this. Um, Davey said I could talk about anything I wanted to, and he did mention social media a little bit. Um, so I'll get a little bit into social media, but I don't consider myself a professional in that realm by any means. Um, so I'm sure you guys could teach me something or two about that. Um, yeah, so the first thing I want to do is kind of get to know you, and you're going to get to know a lot about me during this presentation. And um, if you haven't already, text Jason Turner 181 to that number, 22333. And this was how I was going to get to know you a little bit. So one word to describe yourself. I guess that could be somewhat, some of these things I'm seeing here are now in the moment, and some of these are more broad as far as uh, expanse goes. Um, so maybe learn a little bit about each other too. Right here, basketball, lazy, outgoing, undecided. Ooh, I like that one. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Powerful, spontaneous, motivated, exotic, witty, fun, laid back, good. Okay. Um, anybody else trying to log in that wants to test this out? Yeah. Well, I was just going to say we just send that. Send Jason Turner one eight one two 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 three three three. So I did it, and now do I wait? Um, I don't know, it should give you some... A link or something? Yeah, did it give you like no, a... No, it should give you a confirmation. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Um, so here's, here's, another, here's another fun one. Okay. It's not every day you see a guy in a suit, a money suit, right? So I want to know the first thing that went into your head when you saw me in the suit. Be honest. Like, I don't care. You're not going to offend me. Just be brutally honest. What was the first thing that you thought of when you saw me in a money suit? Money. Awesome. Comedian over here. Goober. Good. <laughs> Extrovert. Interesting. Yikes. <laughs> Tacky. I've heard that one before. I hear, I hear that one a lot. Um, Good man. <laughs> nice baller, yeah. <laughs> Pretentious. I like that one. Actually, what I 
looks like most of you have texted already. What, the, what I was trying to get was that pretentiousness. Like, this whole presentation is the opposite of this. And, um, but that's what I wanted to get at. I was hoping that each of you would pass some sort of judgment. Because as, as people, that's what we do. We, we look at someone and we make an immediate judgment about them. And um, I think a lot of times that judgment is flawed. And so I was trying to get you to think that I was pretentious and um, full of myself because I'm wearing a money suit. Um, so um, we're going to kind of talk about these four things. Anybody know, have anybody, has anybody heard of Simon Sinek? Who has, he wrote the book, The Power of Why, or Start With Why. Anybody? Yeah, has anybody read it? Nice. Um, feel free to chime in, too. Whenever you have anything to say, just raise your hand or whatever, chime in. Um, that's kind of, I, I took a little bit of what he has done and created and kind of added my own spin to it and to teach you a little bit about me and hopefully you can learn a little bit about yourself. So this next one. Text this one in. What is your major? Finance, business management, accounting, personal planning, basket. Bas mm -hmm. what, what? I think it's underwater basket. Oh, okay. Oh, gotcha. There's separate water. Underwater basket weave. Planning, nice. Okay, um, and then everybody in? Everybody in that wants to be in? It says there's like a limited amount of uh, responses. Yeah. Probably because it would just fill, it'd be too small. Okay, um, and then here's this one. What do you want to do or be? <coughs> or what do you plan to do with your degree? Are these only one word responses? You can, it'll pull out like your main word. I texted like a, a sentence and it pulled out like the main word. But yeah, one word would probably be best since it's. Do we have a basketball player in here? A baller? I, I, I'm just wondering because we actually rent a basement to a couple of UVU basketball players. I was just curious. Um, cool. Nice. Operations management, successful. Ooh, I like that. It's not defining any one thing. Um, cool, that's great. Let, I'm gonna kind of, this next, next little bit, I'm gonna show you a video. I was trying to figure out a way to introduce myself. And I have a background in videography. It's one of my, the irons I have in the fire is videography. And so I figured I would create this to introduce myself. Video, what did you learn about me? Like to adventure. Okay, I like to adventure. What else? Seems like to experience new things, travel. Mm hmm. Good, I do. Yeah, yeah. And it's important to you. Thank you. Yes, it is. Anybody else? Yeah. I'm busy. <laughs> I'm busy. 
Yes, <laughs> I am busy. Um, I I kind of wanted to segue into a little bit of my history. Um, I I started here when it was UBSC, and I was doing a business management degree as well, and. I then left for a two-year service mission to Argentina, and when I came back, I had this incessant desire to help people. And I changed my major from business management to psychology, and I wanted to go into marriage and family therapy. And I did that, so I transferred all the credits I could, and I started cranking at that, and I got to, through about, I don't know, a year's worth of psychology classes, and I decided, I was going to be a crappy therapist because I was not going to be able to leave my work behind when I got home. And so I, I decided to change back to business and I went with an emphasis in entrepreneurship and I was in a class and spam, I'm really bad at math, um, it's not my forte. And I had all of, I had saved all of my math, which is a horrible idea. So if you're going to, if you, Putting your math off till the end, don't do that. Um, I, I saved it all to the end, and I had to go do college algebra. And I failed the first class I went to. I had a D. And then the next class, I got, I, I decided to go to BYU and take their online class because it was supposed to be easier. And um, I failed that. And I finally decided, you know what? I'm so sick of this. And I decided I was going to drop out of college. And I started my first business. And my first business was, well, I'll show you this, because this is kind of fun. Um, you'll recognize this, and man, it's amazing how far video has come since then. But this was probably 2005. Um, this was always my dream. I was big in, I worked at a snowboard shop called Milo Sport, and I was big into wakeboarding, snowboarding, skateboarding, that kind of stuff. It was my dream when I would see these ponds out here to do an event out on those ponds. And so I created a winch, which is what was pulling this guy across here. It's connected to the back of a, a truck. And um, we actually did a big event out here with the company I started, which was called Precision Boarding Company at the time. And we got sponsors, so that company was sponsored by a, a wakeboard boat company, Mastercraft. Anybody, anybody else in here wakeboard? Yeah? So Mastercraft sponsored us. They would give us a boat at dealer cost every year. So we would put 350 hours on a boat and then sell it off at the end of the year and make five grand off the boat. Um, I got sponsored by Hyperlite, not because I was good at wakeboarding, but because I had a school. They would give us their whole fleet of boards and bindings and at the end of the year, we had to give it back or sell it off. So we would make a little bit off for that. But the one thing that actually killed it for us, we did lessons out on Utah Lake, but a lot of students would come out here and go to school, and they would leave mom and dad's boat behind, and they all wanted to get out on the water. So we created a punch pass, and it was a 30-minute set. So if you wanted to go out, then you had to have at least three people. You could call us up, and we would take you out on the lake. So the college. The college scene was kind of um, an untapped industry. It still is, honestly, in my opinion. Um, the reason I stopped that was because uh, it gas prices got to like four dollars a gallon, and boats have 110 gallon tanks, and it got really expensive. I also, in that time, in 2000, so I got married in 2004. And in 2008, I think we still ran that business for three years. In 2008, my wife got pregnant with our first kid. I was like, okay, time to be responsible. Time to start getting out of debt and actually do something that makes me money. Because this, honestly, wasn't a money maker. It was more paying for my hobby, um, which it did a good job at that. But one thing that I would say is um, I started, and this is, I, I definitely see the need for higher education, and you're here for a reason. Don't I don't get that. I don't want you to misinterpret what I'm saying. But I started looking at the education I got by trying and failing things, and it was more than I got from a classroom setting. And so I actually started looking at startup costs of businesses as my tuition. And rather than paying tuition, I 
paid to try to start a business. And sometimes it fails and sometimes it worked out. Um, currently, I'm gonna kind of skip around a little bit. Um, currently, I have four businesses that are uh, in operation. This is a, when I was going through this, this was actually really good for me because it caused me to go back to my life and, and kind of review everything that I've tried and done. And um, it, yeah, it was kind of therapeutic for me, I guess, in a way. But these are all businesses that I've started and four of which are still in operation um, and bring in some sort of income. So I, right when I got home from my mission, I, I um, got my real estate license. And I've always done real estate ever since, and that's still like my main bread and butter. Um, but I've always wanted to dabble in other things. My, my, my personality is one such that if I was to do one thing, I would get so burned out on that one thing and just get bored and want to do something else. And so I've always kind of had a lot of irons in the fire, and sometimes I got spread too thin. And for example, so um, I'll bring you back up this for a sec. Um, Okay, so the in 2008 when the market tanked, the real estate market tanked, the recession happened, I felt it and I needed to do something else. I needed something else because I wasn't bringing enough income. And I started a real estate tour company where um, I had always done a little bit of video stuff, just filming my family on the side and I started doing real estate Tours. And that was kind of a new thing back then, so I marketed that to other agents and would do real estate tours for other agents. I then thought, well, maybe I should use this um, video knack that I have and let's try some freelance video stuff. So I did wedding videos, I've done a whole bunch of wedding videos, birth stories, I've done funerals, have been a weird little niche, but um, a funeral video. Um, and I got busy enough when the market came back with real estate that I ended up selling off my real estate tour business, which was Snap Sale, um, and I retained a portion of equity. So all of a sudden I've got, I'm, I'm trying to create different multiple revenue streams and diversify a little bit so that when something happens and something takes, I have something else to kind of repl replenish that income and where I can move my focus. So like this year, I've only done one wedding video um, because real estate's been cranking and that's where I put my focus. But when the market tanks in, which it probably will, um, I will then ramp up my video stuff again, bring that back. And just kind of, it's, it's fun to me. It is very busy and it's, it's hard in some ways because I work from home. I don't even have a home office where I can shut the door. So I have three kids. They're 10, 8, and 5, and they're always tugging at me. Hey, Dad, let's go do this. Let's, hey, come play this game. And I want to go do that, and so I get distracted often. Um, any questions up until this point? I feel like I'm talking a lot. So a question that I have is it seems like you have enough income to do what you want to do and have those experiences. How do you, I guess, save and still retain equity by trying to Okay, so when you say retain equity, you mean like maintain my income? Okay. Um, so I, I have always, like I said, I've always done multiple things. So I worked at a snowboard shop at the same time I was selling real estate, and both of those were kind of part-time gigs, and that allowed me to dabble in other things. And so really time management, I guess, is key. I, I don't watch TV. I don't Netflix, like I don't do Netflix. I focus, my main distraction honestly is social media and it's because I use it in business. It's one of my biggest business tools would be social media and, but I get sucked in. And so that's like my, my, my weak point, I think. Um, but I would say managing my time and utilizing it, getting up early, going to bed early. Um, yeah, I don't know. And then, one other thing that was smart that I would totally recommend is I bought real estate early and I bought smart so that I could rent my basement out 
and my monthly, my mortgage was going to be, it was like 1400 a month, but my basement apartment paid for 600 of that. So making wise financial decisions that, because that paid for half my mortgage, just that freed up not only money, but also it wasn't nearly as stressful to have to worry about all of these big financial burdens, um, debts, that kind of stuff. So I would say that would probably be make smart financial decisions, build your credit, and leverage it in a way that it's not too much, not too leveraged, so that you don't get hosed. I knew a lot of people that would leverage their credit and bought a whole bunch of houses in 2006, and then the market tanked, and they all just filed for bankruptcy, and we're, we're done. So I'm very conservative when it comes to investing. I, I don't like to... I don't like to shell out money to other people. I've, I've, I've made lots of decisions where I've let other people try to manage my money or I've invested in another business and only to have it tank and be gone. And I think to myself, well, if anybody's gonna lose my money, I don't wanna lose my money. And so I've kind of invested more in myself and my own stuff because I feel like then I'm the steward and if I fail, it's my fault. If I succeed, it's my fault. Yeah. So would you necessarily say that that's conservative? Because from the, the viewer's point, I would say you're a pretty risk-taking guy because you're willing to throw out everything on the line to start a brand new business and lose, which real estate is a, one of the highest investments out there. Same with businesses. You can invest in those. is a great high return if it works out, but you can also be trashed overnight. For sure. Because um, you're risk, most risk of adverse, are you? I you gotta be somewhat. Yeah, um, most of my businesses have actually started with. I, don't, I think the most I've ever spent on a business was twenty thousand dollars, and that is this guy right here. Um, I started a pyrotechnics business, and my partner, who it's kind of a fun story. I went. He was always passionate about fireworks. I went to one of his fireworks shows in the park, and I was blown away by it. I was like, wow, this is something different because what he does is pyro musicals and it's all synced to music. So he actually watches YouTube videos, to figure out how long it takes for the firework to go up and explode, and then he'll time that all and sync to music so that it's like this orchestrated experience. Like, I, I've been to a whole lot of firework shows, but when I saw this one, I was like, wow, this is like different. You could feel the music, and it's, it was a different experience. And so he ended up, telling me the next year, he's like, hey, I'm not gonna be able to make this work financially, this is too much money. He was just paying out of his pocket, doing it for fun because he was passionate about it. And I said, well, let me help out. Let me, let me get a, I'll get a lender and a title company and myself and we'll, we'll foot the bill and we'll keep your, keep your passion going. So the next year he did that and that time the crowd at the park doubled in size and um, we kept doing it. And so we did it for probably four years and every time it doubled in size, and then Spanish Fork, this is in Spanish Fork, Fiesta Days, which is their city celebration, they approached us and said, would you like to make your event part of Fiesta Days? And we're like, sure. And at that point, I'm like, you know, you might want to consider doing a business out of this. I mean, you're really good at it, people enjoy it, why don't you consider that? And he's like, no, I don't want to, I'm worried it'll ruin my passion if I, it becomes a job, I don't want to do it. I said, okay, well, if you ever are interested, let me know, because I might be interested in teaming up with you. And so, a year later, he approached me and said, hey, I think I'm ready to try this. And I said, okay. So each of us pitched in 20 grand, and we bought all the things required to start it, and um, that was the most risky that I've ever taken. And honestly, it's been three years now that that's been in business, and I have not seen a dime from it. So, um, in the future, I'm hoping that there's some future potential payout. But um, yeah, that was the most risky that I've done. Everything else has been under, you know, five, 10 grand, yeah. But you don't risk what you don't have, correct? I don't, yeah, no, that's, that's true. That's where his conservatism comes in, is he doesn't risk what he doesn't have. Not, Other people yeah. will, ri will risk everything, even when they don't have everything. So. Yeah, taking out a home equity line on my house and then going to start something, that scares me because all of a sudden I'm putting my family in jeopardy if something were to fail, then my house is on the line and that kind of stuff. So, uh, did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I'm conservative, but I, I guess I am a little bit risky. That's the video one that I did. Um, and I still do a little bit with that. With real estate, I got busy enough 
in the last three years that I wanted some help. I wanted to be able to offload some of my workload. And one of the things that really helped me was I hired what's called a transaction coordinator. And this is one thing I would say would be smart, is whatever your business is or whatever you end up doing, focus on what you're good at and outsource the things that you're not good at. Because um, she is a saint. Her name's Carrie. She does <coughs> all of my paperwork. So I get the paperwork signed and sent to her. And well, she actually will send it out for signatures. So I'll write up an offer on a house, send it to her. She sends it out for signatures, and she just double checks, crosses my T's, dots my I's, makes sure I'm on the ball and I have everything I need. She manages like the whole transaction, which saves me. Um, oh, and the other thing is I started the, using a showing service. So typically before, when people wanted to see one of my listings, they would call me and they'd say, "Hey, I want to go see this," and I have to text my clients, "Hey, I want." got so-and-so that wants to see your house at this time. And it was just this back and forth. And so when I hired the so showing service, they handle all that. And those two things alone, my wife the other day was saying, I feel like you've cut your amount of time on the phone down by at least 50%. And so it's it's been a huge time saver and very, very beneficial. <coughs> but I started a real estate team. So a team works under a broker. And basically, we have six people now on our team. and. Uh, the idea was to be able to share the workload. So if I'm out of town, then I can send one of my guys on my team out to go show the homes or whatever, and we can scratch each other's backs. Um, and that's my newest venture. We've been in business for a year, and it's going well um, until the market tanks. Um, and then I'll have to reevaluate. Re uh, so those are kind of the four businesses that I currently have in operation that I'm focused on. and. Um, Oh, this one, I kind of didn't finish this story. So I got too busy here where I was spreading myself too thin between my real estate clients and this other business that I had started, SnapSell, the real estate tours. I was had agents get mad at me because I couldn't do their tour for three or four days. And I was focusing on their tour. And I had real estate clients getting mad at me because I was focusing on this. And I, I could tell I was, I was doing both clients a disservice by spreading myself too thin. So. I just put a message out on Facebook. I was like, hey, is there anybody out there that's interested in video photography? Um, I've got something that I, uh, I, I'd love to propose an idea to be able to um, get you involved in my business. And so I had three people reach out. I kind of interviewed each one and settled on this couple that wanted to do it. And so we negotiated a valuation of the company. And um, they bought me out. And I retained 30% of the equity. So I still help them, kind of a consulting role. If they're gone out of town, I'll go and take some photos. Um, I also got licensed to do drones, fly drones. And so I do that. That's a, a lot of that video is drone footage. Um, but uh, so all of a sudden, I got this income stream that is now paying me while I'm not necessarily having to work. So passive income is really what I'm looking for. I'm big into rental properties. I've got not big, I have three doors so that we rent out. And um, eventually, I'd like to cash flow enough that you know I can pay off one. Again, I'm a conservative investor. Lots of real estate people would tell you, oh, you don't want to ever pay your house off. I'm the kind of guy that I want the security. And so I want to use the cash flow from one to pay off the other. And my, my father-in-law has done that. And he's got like, I don't even know, 18 rental properties. And he just cash flows. They're all paid off. And he just cash flows every month. And he's he still works as an attorney because he likes to. He's passionate about it. Um, but that's that's kind of my, my retirement plan. I don't know that I'm going to be able to rely on Social Security. And so my retirement plan, and again, that's another, another <coughs> personality thing. Like I like to take ownership of my own stuff. I don't, I don't like to rely on other people. I guess I'm self-sufficient in that way. And um, yeah, so creating multiple streams and diversifying, that's kind of where I'm at. And that's what I would suggest for everyone. If, if there was a way to, for you to diversify and have, I mean, if it's stocks, if it's whatever it is, have, have a, another revenue source besides what you're actively working at. Um, OK, let me get back into here real quick. So this is from a guy. 
named Lewis Conberry. He has a blog called Roman Speaking. And I saw this the other day when I was preparing this. I was like, it makes a lot of sense. You guys all, in, your, in that last slide where you, where you texted in what you wanted to do, you all said things that you wanted to do or be. And the point he's making here, somebody want to read this out loud for me? Go for it. There's freedom in not knowing what you are. Many people place markers around their being about around their being by attaching themselves to their professional title. <coughs> this means that you become that one thing when you, and not only to other people. So if you call yourself a doctor, that's what everyone thinks of you as, as a doctor. Oh yeah, he's a doctor. But what this guy makes the point of is you do things, you aren't a thing, you do things. And by, by limiting yourself to one profession and doing one thing, you're, you're putting yourself in a box. And I kind of like that. I, I was trying to figure out, well, what do I call myself? What do I do? And um, I think the overall overarching theme of what I do, I, I like entrepreneurship because it's a little more broad. It doesn't pigeonhole me into one thing. Um, so let me ask you this, what is the difference between who you are and what you are? Let me get a little philosophical here. You're a human being, right? What, what makes up who you are? I look at the, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Your actions. Like, who I feel like is more uh, arbitrary versus what is, like, yeah. you are this, yeah, job, you are this. So yeah, sure. uh -huh. yeah, I like it. So she said, I don't know if you could hear it in the back, she said, who you are is made up more by your actions. <coughs> and um, that's kind of what I was going to point out in that video. You saw a lot about what I like to do, but that doesn't necessarily tell you who I am. And it doesn't talk about anything about my belief structure or anything like that. But you know a lot about what I like to do. Um, I, I do think that those experiences that you see in that video define, like all of our experiences define who we are as individuals. You were, you've been raised by parents who have an effect on your beliefs and what you've learned. You've been trained by teachers, um, culture. There's culture around that you are a part of. Um, biology, you were born with DNA and some of us have mental illness. Um, there's, there's things that we struggle with. Um, all of these things encompass and make up who you are. Um, and I think that's important. One of the things too with regards to social media, I I think to myself that so often, like in that video, you saw a lot of good stuff, but did you see any bad stuff? No, I added it all out. Like I had somebody to come up to me and say the other day, man, your life is so good, it looks so fun, I always see all your videos, and I'm like, well, yeah, it's because I edit all the bad stuff out. Like, you don't see me yelling at my kids, I don't put that stuff out there, or, you know? I think social media, one of its cons is that all of us put our best foot forward, and that's usually all you see. You don't see the negative. Um, anybody have anything to say about that? Amen. Sure. Amen. Um, okay, we did that. Let's ask this one real quick while we're on this subject. So, again, I don't know your responses, so feel free to respond. You don't have to respond if you don't want to. Um, I have experienced sadness or depression that I contribute to social media. Okay. Um, so between somewhat true and very true, we've got 64% that have had somewhat of sadness or depression because of social media. Um, and I think that's a pretty alarming statistic. I know, do you guys ever heard of Colin Karchner? 
he's a big social media guru is kind of trying to help kids um, from committing suicide and, and the epidemic that technology has kind of brought into our lives. Um, I think I have a slide here. Yeah. Sorry. So in 2012 was the advent of the smartphone and the CDC is, after 20 years of decline in suicide rates, an incline started between 2010 and 2015. And 2012 is when the smartphone was introduced. So I, I am as guilty as anybody with regards to my phone. I, I'm really connected to my phone at all times because of my, my jobs and my profession. Um, but I love actually getting out and, and getting away. Like there's nothing I love more than getting out in the mountains where I can't access my phone because it forces me to connect with nature, to connect with my surroundings and be more present. Um, and I, I love that. So I, I guess I would challenge you to kind of just take note of your social media use and, and what it's doing to your psyche and, and that kind of stuff. Um, uh, <laughs> nice, somebody's already responded to this. This is actually kind of goes back to our conversation that we had about homes and um, making smart financial decisions. But feel free to answer if you want. I'm, I'm curious to see what your answers are. So this one you can actually vote on other people's answers too. So if you put an answer in there, you can vote on other people's. House vote is negative too? How does that work? A ranch. Hey, I got a ranch for sale. <laughs> um. One of the things, too, that I think social media has done, um, and this is from a book called Sapiens. If anybody's ever wants a good read it's about the evolution of the humankind, um, he talks about how the quality of our conversation has diminished. Back in the day, when you used to write letters to people, you would get a, and that was the only form of long distance communication, you would get a letter every three months from someone, and that letter, you spent a lot of time writing. You thought you put effort into that letter, and, um, all right, ranch dressing. <laughs> Some high quality rest dressing. <laughs> cool. Um, okay, we'll come back to that one. Um, so yeah, I I think about nowadays my my I'll be scrolling through my feed and if anything I, I just learned this the other day that the term T L comma D R I didn't know what that meant it means too long don't read. And I'll be, I know I found myself, oh, I'm not going to read that, that's way too many words, you know. But we're so, we're so focused on quickly communicating and making the message short and concise that we oftentimes are, we don't want to put the time and effort into reading and, and finding something out. Okay. Um, I have till three. 45, you said? Okay. Okay. Um, one thing, too, that I would take note of is artificial intelligence um, is big and it's up and coming. I mean, it's been around for a while, but it's changing a lot of industries. And so, in your industry, I would say, when, when Davey said, I always like to be on the forefront of technology. That's why, because I don't think any industry is bulletproof. Um, you're having doctors who are, a computer is being able to recognize cancer on somebody's skin better than a doctor can. So eventually, you might not have skin doctors. Well, you'll, you'll have somebody that does the surgery. Maybe it'll be a robot, who knows? Um, but the diagnosis will be done by your phone. You just put it up to your, your skin. <coughs> I talked to my buddy who actually owns an AI company here in Utah, and he was telling me about how the real estate market could change because there are there's lawnmowers that are self-propelled, and right now they follow along. 
and they'll cut your grass without you having to think about it on a daily basis. And eventually, those little lawnmowers are going to have cameras in them and lasers or, or some sort of device to kill bugs and kill weeds. And so I think about a landscaper and, and that kind of business. Um, eventually, you know, you might, you might be out of business because you've got these lawnmowers that are keeping all the grass cut and, and all the weeds gone and that kind of thing. So keep, a, keep tabs on technology. I think that is a smart thing to do. Um, I would say, I guess this other this part is a little bit about just some advice. Love what you do. Um, uh, I'm going to skip that video. Love what you do. Um, be yourself. Find a niche, something that you can do, that you enjoy. Um, if you're going into a career right now that you're dreading, then I would think twice about that career because it's probably not going to be very fulfilling to you. Um, this right here, I really like this video. So this is a Formula One pit stop. Anybody watches racing? Riding's not that easy, but regularly. This is an example of teamwork is and, is and being good at what you do. Um, I like this example because of how efficient <coughs> So everybody has their little job, one job. said this, I don't know who, you're the sum of your five closest associations. There's also a quote, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Uh, I really like that. I think if you are the best at what you do and you're hanging out with people that aren't as good as you, then it's hard to progress. Um, yeah. Okay, this is something else that I've definitely learned. Someone want to read this? This is by a guy named David Brooks who wrote a book called The Road to Character. Yeah, go for it. Learn to be fine with failure. You have to give to receive. You have to surrender to something outside yourself to gain strength within yourself. You have to conquer your desire to get what you crave. Success leads to the greatest failure, which is pride. Failure leads to the greatest success in order to fulfill yourself, you have to forget yourself. In order to find yourself, you have to lose yourself. Thank you. I love that advice. Because I think so often we look at failure, I mean you're taught from a kid that um, you want to get straight A's. You want to do good on your tests. And so this is ingrained in us that Failing equals bad, succeeding equals good, and 
so often when in my life when I've been succeeding, it's not where I grow. I grow where I fail, and I, I love that advice. Um, yeah. Um, this lady, on the same note, uh, her name is Katherine Schultz. She wrote this book called Being Wrong. And this was one of the game changers for me when I really started to think about my, myself and my beliefs and, and what I do. And she uses the example here. I'll just throw it out there to you guys. She has a TED Talk, so if you want to go watch her TED Talk, it's really good. I recommend it. Katherine Schultz. Um, but she throws it out there. She says, what does it feel like? Do I have a slide for this? Oh, yeah, I have a slide for this. What does it feel like to be wrong? Good, embarrassing, shaming, no good, humbling, fuzzy, lame. So typically, the majority of people, when they answer this question, it's a negative emotion. It's you feel shame, you feel embarrassed. But what she points out is that all of those feelings, they don't come from being wrong, but they come from when you realize that you're wrong. Because when you feel like, when, when you are wrong, you feel exactly like you're right. You don't know that you're wrong until you realize that you're wrong. And that was kind of an eye-opener for me. Wow, that's, that's pretty deep, but it makes sense. Um, and so her whole book is this idea of coming to, coming to appreciate errors and um, being more forgiving with one another because your beliefs might not look like mine and if I come to understand your beliefs, then yeah, I, I just, I would highly recommend her book or, or at least her TED Talk. Um, let's see. Okay, I think we probably ought to, oh. Oh, you didn't see that? Um, let's see. Let's go, let's do our little game before we run out. What do you say, Davey? You said you had somebody that won some contests. How many people were there? Uh, there, I believe there were eight people. Eight or people? There, who was on team one uh, from last time? Uh, you would know <coughs> the name that you came up with was Booty and the Beast. So if you're on that team, stand up and go to the front of the class. Um, might, I don't have eights too many. You might, they might, stand up if you're on that team. That's just the, we got four? Okay, four. Four. four showed up. Perfect. Do you, right. Let me ask you this. Do you guys want to take home some money today? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is just a take. Um, you need another one here? <laughs> So that is that is the name of our prospect team. Is it really? <laughs> Could I maybe have you? We were get shirts. That yeah, say scoot that. over onto this desk, and then maybe we can just use this. Maybe we'll we'll turn it. What did they think of the four by four one? I didn't get feedback. I just put it out there, and they said, "Oh, we like that one. Me um, too. Me too. Me too." Why don't we get two chairs? To I'll pass two chairs over here. Let's grab you. Can I steal these two? Can I take a seat, guys? Can I take a seat? Okay, do you want to dish it out or do you want to keep track of time? Uh, I'll just keep track of time since it's not going to Okay. <laughs> okay, so I've got bunch of ones here, all right? <laughs> um, do you have a phone? Do you want to use my phone? Yeah, oh, mine's a phone. Okay. 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 Two minutes. So you got two minutes for this game. And every 10 seconds. So here's the deal. I'm going to put 
We'll start out with, let's just start out with um, that money there. Okay, so for, you guys can all just take this money. It's up for grabs, whoever wants it. For every 10 seconds, I will double the money that's left in the bowl. Every 10 seconds, go. <coughs> oh, and there's, if you don't, you, you have to take, you have to take. Wait till the end Yeah, first of all, there's no communication. Right, there's not supposed to be communication, but yeah, you, there has to be, you have to take, you have to take money. Well, and the winner but, is who gets the most money. The winner at the end the is who gets the most money. Yes. So, ready? So the idea is get this much money as you possibly can. Let's go. <laughs> There's got to be Kay. some left, right? Ten. That was ten? Okay. Let's try again. Hold on. That was zero. Double zero is zero. So. <laughs> they should That's be true. out. That's true. <laughs> I don't think they can put whatever money is in there doubles. <laughs> yeah, whatever money is okay. left at the end doubles. Okay. Let's try again. Ready, set, go. <laughs> Should we let somebody else try? Yeah, I think we should. Yeah. Especially since they took all the money to her. <laughs> yeah. All right, let, let's have, let four other people try. Uh, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can keep it. Okay. Yeah, you can keep it. Okay. Yeah, Who was on, let's see, the one that got the nut was tough. T-U-S. The ultimate force, was it? Yeah, the ultimate force. Does anybody else who else is on that team? Come on up. You can have five. Keep going. Come yeah, let's, just grab let's, a let's add another. Let's add another to the mix. Sorry, who won that game? Who How much did you each get? How many points did you get? Yeah. Who else was? Six. Six? So who was the winner? Tie. Six. 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 I think the person was the most one. Okay. Okay, this one, the person with the most money at the end of the game yes. gets the pot. Gets the pot. Okay. Same, same rules of the <laughs> Yeah. So it's a two minute game. At the end of 10 seconds, the money doubles, whatever's left in the ball. Whoever has the most money at the end of the game. Get the 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 Ready, set, go. Oh, that wasn't 10 seconds, sorry. 10 seconds. Okay. Okay. That's it. How much you would win? No. no. We can't double money. zero. Oh. The money's gone. <laughs> Seven hours. All right. So everything goes to him. Oh, everything. Oh, that's what you're saying. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. I like it. So, who is team? Who's team? Uh, who's team? Uh, four by four. Two. Two. Go ahead. Come on up. Team four by four. Camera style. It was the team back here.
Jeg fik det til igen. Jeg fik det til igen. emptied the bowl in the first 10 seconds. And the study was all about grief and how most people look after themselves. Um, so thank you. I, that was the first time I tried that. That's why I was probably a little rocky. But uh, next time it would be better. I think the point was made. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so with that being said, uh, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. This I was going to talk a little bit about some of this stuff. Yes, let's go here. These are Steve Jobs, some of his last words. Somebody want to read this for me? I will. So you go for it. In other eyes, my life is the essence of success. But aside from work, I have a, a little joy. And in the end, wealth is just a fact of life to which I am accustomed. At this moment, lying on the bed, sick and remembering all my life, I realize that all my recognition and wealth that I have is meaningless in the face of imminent death. You can hire someone to drive a car for you, make money for you, but you cannot rent someone to carry the disease for you. One, cannot fi one can find material things, but there is one thing that cannot be found when it is lost, life. I love that. Sad, but, but true. Um, so often, where we put our focus and our time is on trying to get more money and earn more. And I've often thought that it's kind of backwards how life is. Um, if somehow there was like a family Ponzi scheme where um, your parents paid for you while you were raising your children, and then you paid for your kids' children's life while they were raising their children, then it would allow me and my point of life to spend more time with my kids and my family, whereas now, you know, I'm focused on work, I'm focused on providing for them, which takes me <coughs> away from them. And um, yeah, so somehow finding that work-life balance is key, and I'm still working on it. Um, I haven't totally figured it out yet, but um, yeah, David. Can I ask you a personal question? Sure. How much satisfaction, like <coughs> personal growth satisfaction, not quite a good to your kids, but self-satisfaction you get from your work from work I actually think I get a lot I think I'm pretty motivated by work I I all of those fun things I like to do snowboarding and wakeboarding all that stuff is fun and it brings like this momentary joy but I also feel like I get the same joy when I am starting a new business or working through some problems and issues like I I still feel a sense of fulfillment but I think that comes sometimes at the expense of my family. Like sometimes I would actually choose that over my family because I think I do have a sense of fulfillment. So, a little guilt, guilty there. Um, uh, let's see here, what else we've got? I love this advice. This is from a book called Happy Money by Elizabeth Dunn. Um, someone want to read these for me? Go for it. One by experiences, research shows that material purchases are less satisfying than vacations or concerts. If we make it a treat, limiting access to our favorite things will make us keep appreciating them. Three, by time, focusing on time over money yields wiser purchases. Four, a now consume later. Late consumption leads to increased enjoyment. Five, investing others, spending money on other people makes us happier than spending money or spending it on ourselves. Great. Does anybody have an experience with this? Yes. I buy experience all the time. Yeah, like I, what? I, uh, I do a lot of food things. So I like to experience food a lot. Um, 
And so I have a very small apartment, and I'm really happy with my small apartment. I never want to actually own a house. Okay. I always want to have a small living space and then buy plane tickets or buy experiences nice. and explore. This sounds so cheesy. Like explore the world rather than having a bigger house. That's awesome. I actually had a real estate settlement this morning, and I helped this these, this couple into their house five years ago, and they now have three kids, and they just sold their house five years later. But they're, the whole reason they're selling their house is because they're outfitting an old Sprinter van in, with a kitchen and living space, and they're just going to go travel the nation and stop and, and live in Airbnbs and, and uh, in their van. And I thought that was, I mean, I could never do that, but it sounds pretty cool. Um, anybody else? Yeah, some, somebody else raised a hand? Yeah. I was just thinking, my wife and I have talked about it, if we could, we'd rather give our kids experiences rather than having a huge house and lavish, but more enjoying the kids' life. Yeah. Um, yes, me, yeah. Um, I'm just looking at the, the what was it? Oh, buying time. Uh -huh. Something my husband always thought is like, we just buy places, not drive. Oh. And it's not because of the cost difference, it's mostly because like if we're going to go to that destination, then maybe just like let's do what we can there and it saves us time. I mean, in some cases, it can like buy time with your family, the driving and the road trip or something. But like if we're just going with us and we want to go to this place, then let's just buy it. Love it. I've actually, um, in mowing my own lawn, I came to the realization that paying a neighborhood kid 20 bucks to mow my lawn allows me to focus that hour and a half on something else that makes me more money. And I think to myself, that's money well spent. <laughs> Anybody else got anything you want to say? Yeah. I just got one. Um, and we didn't run this till later. Uh, number, I can't make it, I can't see it. Anyway, um, for Christmas about 10 years ago, uh, our whole family, so I have a big family, we were buying gifts for each of the brothers and sisters-in-law, et cetera. And we were ending up buying these $25, $30 meaningless gifts. And uh, we were sitting around one Christmas and just said, you know, this is kind of lame, right? We, some people are exchanging gift cards, basically. Um, and we said, we, we want to do uh, investing in others or buying experiences. So we decided that one person would be in charge of finding a family, and then we would do a sub for Santa. Nobody would know how much each family donated except for the one person that was in charge, and we would donate. Then we would all, everybody who could, would go shopping. They'd get assigned a person. We'd all shop. We'd all wrap together. We'd have big dinner, you know, that same time. And each of the kids was assigned one of the kids or a group of kids. And um, the year we did it, I happened to be unemployed uh, during the 2009 uh, era. And my kids were not going to get much for Christmas, but they chose, because of how much they enjoyed this, to give up their meager Christmas gifts to go and do this for somebody else. Oh, cool. And so um, the, the truth of the matter is, is for 10 years now, um, they, they look forward to that more than any gift that they would ever get. And I would highly encourage something like that and one quick anecdote, my best friend, his uh, three boys came to him and said, hey, we're tired of getting gifts, can we just have cash? And that kind of ticked him off. Uh, and so at that point he says, okay, not a single gift ever again. And now they, they did a cruise, they go on a road trip, they do whatever for Christmas, they will not buy their kids a gift ever that's again. Awesome. So. That's cool, mm -hmm. thanks for sharing. Nice, well, um, so, on that subject, why do we do the things that we do? Um, Simon Sinek, I don't know how to say his last name, um, he talks about this, the golden circle. And he says most companies, they start with their what when they're trying to sell something. Like, um, let's say, me in real estate. I sell real estate by providing a great service to my clients and sh keeping their interests in my, in my mind, in front of my mind. That's how most people would sell it. Um, but what good businesses do, and he uses Apple the, as an example, you come up with your why. Why you're doing what you do, and you start with the why and work outward. And what that does is your brain works differently. 
and it com connects on an emotional level. So rather than Apple saying, we sell computers by creating a great user experience, they say, we want to revolutionize <coughs> the world and we plan to do so. We do that by creating a great user experience and we sell computers or whatever. You just reverse it. And so I have often thought of that and um, tried to identify what my why is. And there's a term, does anyone know what the term altruism means? What, what would you, how would you define altruism? It's like doing what you want to do, like being true to yourself, I guess. Okay. Like being altruistic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has to do with like giving of yourself and, um, and yeah, there's, there's a, uh, a podcast that I wanted to share with you that's along those lines, and it's called Radiolab. Anybody ever listen to Radiolab? This one is called The Good Show. So I'm going to play, let's see how much time we got. Ten minutes? Okay. Yeah. We're going to listen to this for five minutes. The, so there is a foundation called the Carnegie Hero Organization. And what they do is they look around the world for people who have done heroic acts and they reward them. They reward them monetarily and with a medal. And um, if you go to Carnegie, carnegiehero.org, that's their organization. Um, but so they interviewed the head guy at the Carnegie Hero Foundation, and their whole point behind this podcast was trying to get to the bottom of why <coughs> people do what they do. And so they interviewed a few people prior to this guy that I'm going to show you. And nobody could really get to the bottom of their why, why they, why they did this heroic act. But this guy does, and uh, I, I, it's pretty cool. Do you have a definite answer as to what propels people to do this? No. One more shot, Walter. He told us about a case. That of all the cases he's heard, this is the one that puzzles him the most. It's the case of Wesley James Autry, a, a construction worker from uh, New York, 50-year-old man who did jump into the uh, track bed in a subway station to remove a uh, fellow, a young man, who had fallen onto the track. The gentleman was uh, six foot, 108 pounds. He was, he was inert, and yet Mr. Autry persisted despite the fact that a train was coming. There would come a point, at least, at least in my estimation, where he would have to say, I have to get out of here because I'm going to be killed. I'm, I'm not suicidal. But Mr. Autry didn't think that way. He and I part in this in this manner. What he did was he lay atop the victim between the rails while the train passed over them. In the farthest reaches of my imagination, I can see myself jumping onto a subway track to attempt the rescue. What I can't see myself doing is lying atop the victim while the train passes over me. Making this story even more nuts. <coughs> When we finally met up with Wesley Audrey on the platform where this incident happened, under 35th and Broadway, he explained to us that his daughters had been with him. Everything was okay. And uh, two lady daughters. Uh, at that time, my daughter was four and six, and this, this, them there. <laughs> Show this picture. Oh my God. Super cute. Uh, the one behind me is Shuki, and this is the baby Sashi. So when they're standing there, this guy starts convulsing and then eventually falls off the platform onto the tracks right as a train is coming. His choice is pretty stark. In order to save this complete stranger, he's got to leave his daughters behind. Potentially without a dad. Looking at him shaking and going into another seizure. For some strange reason, a voice out of nowhere said, don't worry about your own, don't worry about your daughters. You can do this. So he jumps, runs to the guy, is he conscious? No. no. He tries to grab the guy's hand. And each time I grab his hand, we'll slip apart. And when he slip, I look up the train and get close. I grab his hand again, we'll slip apart. The train is closer. So 50 feet, 20 feet, 10 feet, and that's right there. And all he can do is grab the guy, get him in a barrel wagon, and flatten his body against the guy as much as he can. The first train call just grazed my cats. The train car went right over there. When the train came to a stop, four to five cars passed over us. 
I looked him in the eye and said, excuse me, you seem to have a seizure or something. I don't know you, you don't know me. So I just kept talking to him until he came through. And he was like, well, where are we? I'm like, we are looking for train. He said, well, who are you? I said, I came down to save your life. So he kept asking me, are we dead, are we in heaven? I gave him a slight pinch on his arm. He's like, oh, just said, see, you and you are very much alive. I can hear my daughter screaming, so when that train come to a stop, uh, I yelled up from underneath the train, excuse me, I'm the father, we're okay, I just want to let my daughters know that, I, that I'm okay because I know that they are worried about me. Everybody start clapping. Can I ask you a question? So it's, it's the point at which you said you heard a voice yes. that said, I can do this. I can do this. What's, what, what is amazing to me is that you left your daughters right here and died I, after a guy you don't well, know. He was a stranger, total stranger. But you know what? The mission wasn't come completed. I was chose for that. You felt chose like you, you were chosen. chosen. I felt like I was chosen. Wow. But for a religious person, though, I would wonder. Okay, I'm going to stop it there. Why? You can go back and listen to it. He actually talks about how early on in his life, he somebody held a gun to his head and pulled the trigger, but the gun didn't go off, and so he felt like God had chosen him for that moment. Um, and so, really, I guess what I wanted to get at here um, is your why. What What is your why? Anybody want to share their why? Anyone feel comfortable sharing what their why is? Why you're sitting here? Why you're going into the career that you're going into? Yeah. Um, I was employed in, uh, during the uh, recession and whatnot, and uh, I got to some difficult managers, but I had to right, yeah. yeah. of my family. And I realized then that uh, I was doing what I want to do now, uh, specifically because I want to do better, be better. Nice. I like that. That's awesome. Um, finishing up here, this is my why. Um, I kind of wanted to talk about this experience. Sorry if I get emotional. Um, I had just cashed, well, I, I had just closed a big real estate deal and I had picked up a check. And I was going to the bank to deposit the check. And I was going up 800 South in Orm, and I was headed up toward Costco from Will's Pit Stop. And I saw this car on the side of the road that was, this lady had a flat tire, and she was driving on a rim. And I thought to myself, there was a car in front of me, and I was hit, and I had a feeling that I should stop and help her. And the car in front of me actually pulled over behind her, and I said, oh. He's got it. I'll just keep going. He's got it. And I kind of brushed it off. And I was standing there in the line at the bank to deposit this check. And I thought to myself, that was so shallow of me. Why? There's got to be something more I can do. And so I came to my, I, I kind of decided in my head that, um, OK, we're by Costco. I'm going to go to Costco. And if she's in line to get some tires at Costco, I'm going to help her out. Anonymously. I wanted to do it anonymously. So I go to Costco. And sure enough, there she is in the Costco line to buy tires. And I, go to, I went to an employee that was working and kind of hid behind some tires. And I said, hey, is there a way I can help this lady out? Um, she's she's kind of, I could tell she, like her other tires were definitely bald. And I was like, she seems like she's a fine. I want to help her out. And she said, well, let me go see what I can find out. And she went to go find out. And all of her tires needed to be repaired and, or replaced. And she came back to me and said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, oh, let's, let's do it. And I was having the same feeling while I was there. And I said, yeah, let's just do all of them. And so she said, all right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to this. I'm going to go walk her up to the counter. I'm going to ring her up. And then I'll just distract her. You bring her up here. You just swipe your card and walk away. And so that's what I, that's, that's what I did. And in that moment, I thought, you know what? Like, that's, this is what life's about. It's 
Life's about relationships, and it's about it's about being our best selves. And so, I guess I would challenge you um, to to figure out what your why is, and um, do what you can to improve yourself and become your best self, whatever that looks like. And um, yeah. Any other questions? I'll be here after class. Otherwise, thanks for sticking around. I think I'm right on time. Oh, uh, you'll notice too, I'm in a cheesy Halloween suit in this picture. Tacky, that's something to